Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Vino Srinivasan, who is a Managing Director and the Co-Head of Structured Credit Group with Mizuho Securities. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we get into the meat of the conversation, do you want to tell us a little bit about where Mizuho plays in the aviation finance space? Sure. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Airline Economics. Um, we're a um, full-fledged uh, bulge bracket U.S. Uh, investment bank, and we do unsecured debt for all the lessors. Uh, we lend unsecured to the lessors. We have started lending warehouse capital to the lessors and uh, are very dominant in the aircraft ABS space, uh, which is primarily where, um, where my team uh, plays within Mizuho. Um, there is some lending to the airlines out of Japan, but uh, largely it's been financing the aircraft lessors and bringing in equity players into the uh, aircraft market. Excellent. And can I ask you, as we, maybe before we get into that kind of leasing and finance market, just, just your thoughts generally on where we sit from a recovery perspective. We have had you know, the most challenging 21 months we've ever seen, but with, with, with green shoots of recovery consistently probably over the last 12 months, a little bit two steps forward, one step back. But, but your thoughts on where the air travel market sits at the moment? Well, I think it's... Um... It's spotty, right? Um, I think domestic markets like the US as well as China and India, et cetera, have been quite, um, quite active and uh, you know, uh, traffic, air traffic in those markets have come back to pretty much where they were in 2019. Um, again, I think uh, you're gonna see uh, this continue into 2022 where you've got areas of stress like Southeast Asia, for example, where with the Omicron variant, there's been Actually, even with the Delta variant, there's been lots of shutdowns uh, between uh, countries in Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia continues to be a problem uh, a part of the world. Uh, I think Europe, it's going to really depend on this next summer, uh, 2022 summer. And if we don't see any further variants after the Omicron uh, variant. But I think it's going to be this slow, gradual buildup with domestic markets being strong, uh, the large domestic markets. But international still being spotty depending on um, how COVID uh, develops over the next 12 months. And in terms of then opportunities for funding on the airline side, you, your thoughts there, and I'm particularly interested, do you think we will see a bunch of airline 2.0s? So we'll talk to balance sheet stress on the airline side in a second, but the opportunity for maybe startups with clean balance sheets to take advantage of what we all hope would be a recovery that, that's coming. Yes, I do believe so. I mean, we've already seen some in 2021, and I think it'll continue into 2022. And, and on to what we've seen then on the, in relation to the lessors is that balance sheet stress has increased, I'd say, the importance and popularity of the leasing channel. You know, we talked about that 50% threshold for a long time, probably clearly breached at the moment. Some of the lessors would be very bullish about you know, a 60% target for funding of new deliveries. What are your thoughts in that space? Do you think the pandemic has given rise to a sustainable step change in the importance of leasing? I think it has. I do. I think we were already heading that way before the pandemic. Um, you know, uh, numbers between like, if you go back, you know, 10, 20 years to where we were in 2019, uh, the share of the aircraft ownership by the leasing market was increasing um, steadily. And I think the pandemic has just accelerated that. Um, I think airlines, even though um, some are well capitalized and some have had uh, government support, when we come out of the pandemic, I think uh, they're still going to be relatively weak from a balance sheet standpoint. And I think uh, leasing is going to become an increasingly big part of their um, their aircraft uh, you know, uh, usage. So I do think that this has accelerated the portion of the ownership that leasing will control uh, going forward. And your thoughts around how competitive that market is when you're assessing your, you know, your, your customers in that space um, and the pricing they're obtaining. What are your thoughts around there? There seem to be you know, some form of COVID bounce to the lessors, maybe you know, by the second half of last year, kind of eroded with competition, it seems. But your thoughts around the pricing piece and, uh, and your perspective? Well, I think it's important not to forget that leasing has always been a spread over base rates, right? So... When you've had the Fed pump in so much money into the system over uh, this last 12 to 18 months, um, the U.S. Fed, obviously, um, they, uh, the amount of capital that's flown in and rates being so low, 
um, it is just inevitable that um, you know lease rates are low and lease rate factors, for example, on new aircraft is as low as 0.55 right now. Um, I don't see that changing dramatically over the next 12 months. I think there'll be a gradual creep up as rates rise if uh, inflation kicks in in the US. Um, but you know, people always forget they want hard returns of like you know double digits, et cetera. But the bottom line is leasing's always been a spread over the base rates. And when rates are so low, it's inevitable that lease rates are low as well. And your thoughts around that, that, that rising interest rate environment that we're going to come into, if you mentioned the Fed, pretty well signaled, we'll have two or three rate raises next year. Your thoughts on how, do you see that being net positive, negative, or relatively neutral for your, your leasing clients? Well, I think it's positive, right? Because um, a lot of them have uh, refinanced their existing debt at very low rates. Uh, and you have to break up the leasing community into two pieces, right? One is the uh, investment grade lessors that are reliant on the unsecured market. And they've all taken advantage of the rate environment over the last 12 to 15 months and reset really uh, longer term debt. Um, and so if rates start going up, you know, lease rates would go up at a, with a lag. And as long as the debt maturities are still further out, you're going to see a net benefit to the lessors. Uh, the other category are asset managers who raise funds and have warehouse capital and then access the ABS market for uh, permanent financing. And even in that market, ABS uh, deals post COVID have, are pricing a good 100 basis points inside of the best deals uh, pre COVID. So everybody's taking advantage of the rate environment. And, and on that kind of broader debt environment, well, what, what's your view on? call it the traditional aviation debt space before we move into the capital market side. There was a retrenching clearly when COVID occurred. Do you feel like that market is kind of back active and functioning in a real way? Yeah, I do think so. Um, I think the bank market is back. Uh, the bank market kind of took a little step back in, I would say, 2020, probably the second half of 2020. In 2021, we've seen uh, banks back lending. And then you've seen these other debt providers come into the space um, Castle Lake set up a debt fund and you've got Bolofin and others uh, of that ilk. Um, really, I think what they've really done is uh, picked up the slack that's occurred with DVB being bought by MUFG and not really uh, lending in that fashion that they used to lend. And then PK was also a little bit uh, quiet initially, but they've now started to get quite active. So I think these are just, uh, you know, sources of debt that are filling that gap. Um, but the bank market's definitely bad. On that alternative lender piece, do you see that trend continuing? Do you see potentially more entrants coming to the space in the near term? Yes and no. I think uh, you're going to see airlines, as we come out of COVID, still you know struggling a little bit with uh, you know without having strong balance sheets, and so uh, opportunistic lenders are going to be critical in that in, from a support standpoint. And banks still prefer. You know, well-capitalized companies when they lend seniors. So I think there is a, a place for them. And I, but I don't think it'll be a huge part of the market. I think it'll be, like I said, I think it'll replace uh, what DVB was doing prior to their acquisition by MEFG and uh, perhaps a little more than that, given that, you know, we're probably in a prolonged uh, period where airlines are still going to have some issues coming out of COVID. And on the unsecured market, which you guys would obviously follow very closely, the, and to the point you mentioned on IG rated lessors, a phenomenal ability to tap that market, you know, 11 billion in H1, then you had Aircap go in a very significant way to fund the GCAS acquisition. Do you see, well, let me ask you a broader question. What do you think that evidence is about the maturity of the aviation finance space? Um, this is a quote I've uh, heard from my colleague, Andrew Waddington all the time. This is not a cottage industry anymore. It is a very well followed, very well tracked sector. Um, if you look at uh, aircraft leasing as a function of the unsecured market, now there are multiple players that have been constantly tapping that market. There's been a sea change between how aircraft leasing was viewed uh, post and pre uh, global financial crisis. I think before that, it was still viewed as a very cottage industry type uh, sector. But now I think it's a very mature sector. Uh, you're seeing... Uh, a lot of equity research uh, on the public companies there. You're seeing a lot of debt research on the unsecured issuers. Uh, this is a very mature industry. And, and you mentioned that the bifurcation of the market, the IG rated lessors and those that aren't IG rated. 
is there a danger of the haves and have nots? And therefore, in order to really have scale and be able to price and compete in a very large scale manner, you need to be IG rated lessors. Some of the others just have to compete on different fronts. I don't think it's a case of have and have nots. I think it's a focus on different parts of the market. Um, the investment grade lessors typically have our order book lessors or have a significant order book that's coming in and hence need access to that, uh, the deepest market in the world, which is the investment grade market in order to address their capital needs. The, um, the asset managers, which are the other piece of the um, you know, leasing community, they, because they raise closed end funds and you know they deploy that capital, they tend to focus a little more on midlife assets. And so the, there's a, there is a bifurcation in terms of focus on types of aircraft and age of aircraft. But even the um, asset managers have been able to raise capital that have much lower return expectations, where they're actually doing sale lease backs on brand new aircraft as well. So like I said, I think it goes back to the, uh, the basic... Uh, premise here, which is that leasing is a spread over interest rates and interest rates are low. So, you know, um, that's where it is. And, and on the ABS side, which again, you'd be very close to, um, two, two, two part question, right? One, has it surprised you how quick it's come back? You know, we, we 10 billion in 19, you're tracking for something similar in 20. Uh, your dog definitely agrees on that point. And then if we look into, uh, the market should, but, but we came back so strongly this year. I think we're up over 8 billion in assets done. Has that surprised you? And linked to that, have there been fundamental structural changes or is it really around the edges with a bit more focus on airline quality and credit? Um, I think it has surprised me, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the recovery has been much uh, quicker. Having said that, um, the, the, you know, the three quarters of 2020, uh, the calendar year after March, were actually really tough, right, on the, uh, on the ABS side because there was no issuance. And, uh, you know, people like me and my group who rely on that market, uh, there was really not a whole lot to do at that point, which was a nice break, I must admit. But having said that, you know, you still have to feed the kids. So uh, it was really a pleasant surprise in 2021. But if you stick, take a big step back, perhaps it's... Um, it was, it was predictable given that, again, going back to the Fed pumping all that money into the sector and you know there's a wall of money looking for yield and uh, aircraft ABS actually provides uh, a better yield than the flow ABS side, right? If you think about the ABS market, it's typically about 200 billion in issuance a year. This year, actually 2021, there's been 312 billion. So uh, it's, it's really made up for 2020 to a, certain, to a large extent. And, uh, you know, autos and credit cards, which form about half to, you know, 60% of that market, uh, given the low rate environment, those deals are pricing at, you know, sub 1%. So when you see aircraft at two and a half yield, um, that is very attractive to these ABS investors. Uh, and so, um, you know, perhaps uh, I should have predicted it better, but um, it's, uh, it's inevitable given the capital that's been pumped into the system. And your thoughts on whether they are significantly structurally different on the pre and post COVID element? So um, yes and no. Uh, I would say that the big picture, it's not really that different. The LTVs for single A bonds have been about 65%, triple Bs about 75, double Bs may be a little more conservative at 80 or 79 versus as high as 85 pre COVID, uh, which is really what most people focus on, right? The LTVs and the pricing. Pricing is actually inside of where the market was in 2020, uh, 2019. Um, having said that, there have been a few triggers that have been added to the structures. Uh, for example, the two that I see uh, that are going to be uh, continuing, but they're really on the, around the edges. Uh, one is the DSCR trigger, which used to be a six-month trailing average, now is a three-month trailing average. And the second is uh, minimum number of aircraft uh, that these deals need to have. The agency is very focused on that because when COVID hit and uh, some of the e-note trade deals, the investors uh, went back to the lessors and said, listen, I, I really don't want to take all these aircraft on. Um, those deals ended up getting shrunk and the agencies are very focused on making sure there's a minimum number of aircraft on these deals. What is that number? Uh, it varies. Uh, it's probably you know, around 9, 10. Okay. Uh, yeah. and, and typically, I guess we've seen a dozen to 18. Uh, well, uh, Pre-COVID, you used to see 20, 25 aircraft in a deal. Even now, I think if you want to get a, you know, uh, 
new issuance done, you're really around 14, 15. Um, but they will have a trigger in the structures that say that if you have less than nine aircraft, the entire structure goes into full cash sweep or early M. Yeah, we're just kind of going back to the kind of unwind to start three, I guess. When you, That's right. Yeah, when you, when you look then at 2022 and we've seen predominantly the debt market and ABS come back and, and maybe a, a clubby ABS on the equity note side, do you foresee over the course of the next 12 months, we get back to something approaching tradable E note? With, with a bunch of investors coming on the equity side or what are your thoughts? Well, I think it'll start with a single buyer of E-notes, which is what it was back in 12, 13, 14. Uh, it'll start with that, but I think the pace at which it'll go to tradable will be much sooner this time than it was last time, mainly because the technology exists. We've already broken through the barriers to establish that product, but it will start with a single buyer, a club buyer. Um, Again, I've heard people say in the aviation community, oh, that market is not opened or the investors are not back. That's actually untrue. They're all there. They, they have been wanting to buy e-notes. The issue has been that the larger lessors that typically sell aircraft have not really traded aircraft in 2020, 2021. And part of that goes back to the OEMs, the Airbus and Boeing supply chain issues with regards to uh, deliveries have been much slower uh, for various reasons. And as a function of that, the large lessors haven't taken on new aircraft at the pace they would have expected to, and hence haven't had to sell at the pace they would normally do. So I think all that's coming to a head in 2022. You're going to see uh, deliveries are picking up. And so the large lessors are going to have to start selling, whether they sell to other startup uh, aircraft lessors or established midlife buyers, or whether they tap the ABS market with e-notes. Um, you're going to probably see a combination of both. So I expect uh, e notes trades to start happening uh, from the start of 2020. Yeah, I, I'd echo that, right? I think the things we're seeing on our side would very much support what you're talking about and that appetite for particular in private equity on taking the e note, even the clubby or, 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 or collective basis, one or two other parties. And then you throw in aircraft GCAS and how many aircraft and portfolios come to the market after that, right? We'll see. That's right. Can I ask you maybe a broader question? It's probably linked a little bit to the air cap piece um, around consolidation and size and scale. Um, you know, I, I think no one or very few foresaw a transaction that large happening. And you know how this outlier, 2000 aircraft and number two, 600. Um, your, your thoughts on what that means from a wider perspective or does it? Does super scale matter where you have large scale? So we spoke to those IG rated lessors. Will we see greater appetite for trying to build a lot greater scale, which feeds into that M&A and consolidation point? I think there's always going to be pressure on that front. I think people are going to try to uh, get bigger uh, because once you have a management team that's well established, you don't really need to keep adding people in order to take on more aircraft. So if you look at a number of larger platforms that are investment grade, uh, they've been, um, you know, really trying to acquire um, pools of assets or companies in order to take on the assets. Um, so you're going to see that continue. It's just uh, interesting because I, I'm not really sure there's a whole lot more that can be acquired at this point. So maybe you'll see a couple of deals here and there, but um, I mean, the 800 pound gorilla was obviously the AirCap GCAS uh, acquisition. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. You look at the top 20 and you don't see a lot of motivated sellers. And obviously, we've got the two transactions that are kind of rumored that kind of you, all right, you can kind of understand. Not that it's hard to see. Probably a pin in Avalon, a bit of pin in Avalon for maybe two years, right? Um, can I ask you then, do you see a continuation of new, new platforms in a similar fashion? You know, we've seen the really U.S. private equity predominantly, right, um, still continuing to push cash in and build out um, some new players or maybe smaller players with big ambitions. Do you see that trend line continuing? Um, to a lesser extent, I think uh, a lot of platforms that needed to get uh, who have started up have started up in the second half of 2020 into 2021. So um, when you take a new management team to meet a lot of these private equity funds and uh, hedge funds, et cetera, to raise capital, um, they're much more sophisticated. They've seen a number of management teams and uh, they've committed capital in different situations. So I think you'll still see, you know, a handful still try to uh, start up and form new platforms, but I think the bulk of them are already done. And probably feeds into then the, the larger overarching piece that's existential world crisis, but it's going to have a huge impact in aviation, which is the ESG agenda, climate change impact. Can I ask you, 
do you think it's having a real impact on aviation finance as of now, either in respect of the ability to debt raise or how they're interacting with investors? No, well, not you, right now. Uh, yeah, I think everybody do, do is think aware of- Do you think it's coming? Yes, it is coming. It is definitely coming. Um, there's no question about that. But uh, I, I still think it's, uh, it's a few years away in, in terms of uh, actual impact on financing cost or equity raise, et cetera. Um, it, it's something that everybody's focused on and they're still trying to figure out exactly how to do it. Um, there's also KPIs, which uh, various organizations are, kind of, there's not a standardized set, so to speak. So um, it's definitely an area of focus no question, and it's definitely coming. But if you ask me today, is it having an impact? No. And to, to speculate wildly, right, because it's one I'm kind of curious about as much as anything, what does, it won't be green, right? But what does a greener aviation kind of debt raise look like? Is it just narrow body new tech, you know, and, and, and that's what you fund and there might be bonuses on the basis points or just your thoughts over, if you talk about sustainable finance or green finance, which is challenging in aviation, how do you think that might look in the future? Well, I think um, really carbon offsets are really the only thing that uh, is actionable right now, right? So that, that's definitely a focus on that. Um, the second item is probably sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, but I, that, again, is a few years away. I, 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 um, electric aircraft are still years away. I mean, if you look at electric cars, you still don't see a ton of them on the roads, right? It's, it's definitely coming, but um, we're still years away. Um, but again, you know... Um, if everybody focuses on it and a lot more resources are, um, you know, spent in, in developing um, all those aspects that make it more ESG friendly, um, it could come faster, but we're still years away. And I suppose one of the drivers of that will be on the OEM side. Curious on your thoughts on OEM interaction with lessors. Do you see the pandemic giving rise to a shift in the nature of that relationship? If we work on you know, the assumption we talked about that lessors start to fill more deliveries, um, be it order book or sale at lease back, do you see the dynamic changing a little bit between lessors and OEMs? Well, I think it's become uh, much closer through the pandemic. Uh, the OEMs are very dependent on the lessor community, uh, big deliveries. So um, I think that will continue. But it goes back to the broader equation that is that I think less, uh, leasing companies are going to have a bigger share of aircraft ownership going forward than they've ever had. You think more of them go down the order book route? I, uh, not necessarily. I think uh, you've got some very established players that are already uh, going down the order book uh, track. I think you'll see a couple of new guys go into that space, but um, a lot of the. Uh, it's a conundrum, right? Because the startups have raised capital that are targeting a certain return. It's generally not a very low return. And uh, given rates are low and on new aircraft, the uh, lease rate factors are relatively low, um, they tend to focus on midlife aircraft. And so I think uh, you're not going to see, see a huge shift in that. Uh, yeah, that I, I, know, I, I totally get the logic on that. You see, see Griffin kind of dipping their toe in the water with the kind of five order book. That's then, right. Just curious, right, as, as to where it might go from there. Um, can I ask you on the, on the cargo side, uh, Vinny, uh, your thoughts on, is there a genuine opportunity in there? Cargo has always been spiky, you know, or a bit, a bit more cyclical. Would you accept that e-commerce pandemic has delivered a real step change on cargo that will stay there? And just your thoughts on the opportunity for aviation finance, if so. Um, yes, I do believe that uh, the cargo piece is a bigger piece of the pie now than it ever was. And I think that's here to stay. Um, you just look at custom, consumer uh, behavior, right? Um, you're seeing uh, brick and mortar stores go out of business, right? There's people are not necessarily going to a store to buy things. You're ordering stuff online. Now, obviously that's been, um, oh, you know, definitely uh, accentuated by the fact that you've had COVID and people are working from home, et cetera. But, you know, that, that actually goes back to a bigger question, you know, is working from home going to become a bigger piece of life in general? And uh, I think in order to retain high quality employees today, you do have to have a flexible work plan where, you know, some people may prefer to work from home. Um, and if that's going to be a bigger trend, it just leads to, you know, people needing a lot more office equipment and everything else at home and uh, e-commerce becomes a bigger piece of that pie. And, uh, so I do think that cargo is going to be a bigger piece uh, than it was before. 
whether, uh, you know, when passenger traffic comes back to 19 levels globally and we're over the COVID thing, uh, I don't know that it's going to be, uh, you know, take a lot of share away from passenger aircraft. But um, I think the concept of ordering stuff to your house is going to be around and probably a more prominent piece of retail purchasing than, than we've ever seen in the past. Yeah, and no, I think it's one where we're going to be chatting about definitely more in, in 12 months time to just be very interesting. As you say, long haul comes back, belly capacity, just what that does to, to what we've seen so far. Can I ask you more generally on, on the metal side, your thoughts on what you view as the investable aircraft predominantly? And I know we're going to say narrow body, new tech clearly, right? Um, given the ESG piece we've talked about, need to renew fleets, environmental concerns. But, but your thoughts beyond that? So if you're, if you're considering kind of your customer basis and the fleet that they have, what are you valuing? Well, I think you, uh, it's funny, every time there's a crisis, everybody runs to the newer, shinier objects, right? And uh, you've seen that happen over the last 12 to 18 months, but uh, this is an interesting one because the returns are not there on the newer stuff, right? So you do see uh, people now gravitating towards midlife aircraft. The piece that is, going to be interesting to see how it plays out is going to be the ESG piece, you know, with the midlife aircraft. And so, um, you know, that's an interesting uh, situation that we'll need to see how it plays out. But um, I, in terms of aircraft types, I think, uh, you know, both new and midlife aircraft are getting financed quite, uh, quite well in the, in the markets uh, with, with banks as well. I mean, you saw in uh, the second half of 2021, a number of midlife aircraft ABS deals come to market. And get done. So, uh, you know, the returns are higher on those aircraft. So there will still be a significant demand. And broad, more broadly, on the investor space, and those that you have come to the space post pandemic, um, have you seen any trends on the types of investors that have got interested? Or is it the same types of capital, different players, but we're still talking Japan loves aviation, you know, a little cautious at the outset, but, but seems to be back involved. Private equity is just there, right? Has been there in the past. He's been there in a very real way now. Really curious on what you're seeing on the investor side and where you think that might go. So you're seeing a lot of the same uh, players in different platforms, as you just mentioned. There, Japan's obviously still there. Uh, China maybe has eased off a little bit. Uh, you saw a lot of uh, Chinese capital back leasing companies that came to the fore, especially in Hong Kong at the start of the last cycle. That's obviously, you know, less relevant today uh, with the issues that Hong Kong's having as well. Uh, you are seeing private equity. They always come in at the start of a cycle, and this is arguably a start of a cycle. Um, the one uh, investor community that we're seeing come into the space that maybe hasn't dabbled in this before are infrastructure funds. A lot of infrastructure funds used to play on uh, airports uh, within aviation, but they're now starting to gravitate into aircraft leasing, et cetera. So if, that, if I had to pick one you know, community of investors that are, that's relatively new that's coming into the space, it'd be infrastructure funds. And you think that's on the basis to the points you made earlier, not a cottage industry, a more established asset class, and probably a trend that will continue? Yes, absolutely. In, in closing, um, and I generally like to throw this out, um, and I should have said it at the start, we're recording this three days before Christmas. Uh, so if there's, a, if there's a terrible variant in the next two weeks, we won't blame you. Um, but to ask you, what are your optimism levels as you look out into 2022? Well, I think um, I think we're in a re recovery cycle, right? So I think things should get better in general. Uh, you're seeing the capital markets quite active. So uh, there is money uh, and that will support uh, the aviation community. Um, so hopefully, you know, we're this time next year when we have this conversation, we've had a rocking year all around. Um, you know, but I think from a personal standpoint, I think certain trends are here to stay. I think people are going to be careful about, you know, um, mingling too much, etc. I think there's, there's a bit of a, I remember about 10 years ago when we used to travel to Asia, like after the Asian bird flu thing, you used to see people wearing masks. Um, and uh, that was pretty much just around uh, certain parts of Asia. Now you see that all over. I, I just wonder if, you know, even if we're all over COVID and, you know, it becomes a flu shot type thing every year, uh, whether that people are going to be a little more careful uh, with regards to how they interact, et cetera. Um, but that's on a 
social level, I guess, from a, from a business standpoint and financial standpoint, I think uh, we should look forward to this as the start of a nice long cycle. We'll echo those very optimistic sentiments. Uh, Vinod, I'd like to thank you for your time and insights today and wish you and your company the very best for 2020. You too, Joe. Thank you very much, Joe.